Thank you for talking to TwoCircus.net, uh, Ravi. And uh, you started Aid in uh, 1991, right? Yes. And it's been it's been a long time. Uh, but I want to know, go back in time and think, you know, when it came into being and how, what was going on in your mind when? Was... Basically, I was a graduate student here. Came to the U.S. to do my, uh, you know, PhD in physics. So what I found was that, uh, you know, many of my friends, uh, they were uh, interested in India and uh, any any time Washington Post, for example, reported that something is happening in India, it would set off a discussion in our student circle. So I kind of felt that, uh, you know, though we are here at heart, our mind uh, it goes back to India and to the causes of India and to the people of India. Uh, but then uh, I noticed that there wasn't an active channel to get involved, so it was all more more talking about like what we should do and so on. Mm. Uh, so I started it with the idea that uh, it would be active in the sense that the first email that I sent was that uh, you know let's take a village in India uh, where there is no school, for example, and then find a teacher and would you be willing to donate some money? And that's the kind of mail I sent to my friends and with a clear action agenda on it uh, and then uh, I got responses and and that's how uh, you know it started and in the very first meeting uh, you know I kind of uh, said that we need to uh, work on all issues because I realized that there would be a big learning curve uh, most of us uh, you know when we were in India uh, we were uh, you know maybe from the cities not so much from the villages uh, so villages of India are alien to us and uh, it involved learning, it, it obviously would involve uh, learning and, uh, and knowing what others are doing and uh, sharing our resources and strengths with their resources and strengths uh, and then doing something together. So we decided to work on all issues uh, and not uh, because we realized that uh, problems in India are connected to one another and uh, then, then it's not... Uh, they what, was, was that your learning process? or? Is that understanding from the beginning that, you know, it's, it's more than education? Oh yeah, that was right from the beginning. Partly it was because probably I was a physics student. Uh, so I kind of thought uh, when I started it that either what we start would grow exponentially or it would come down exponentially. Because to, in my mind, if you start something, it's very hard for it to be at the same state. So either things happen so that it really grows or... Uh, and, and that's because of the feedback loops, you know, like mm -hmm. when you do something, you learn and you get better. And that same kind of thinking about various loops uh, led me to realize that, uh, you know, what people know that like everybody says that Indian problems are interconnected and there are these vicious cycles of poverty. So what I put up as a vision was that similarly the solutions are also interconnected, mm -hmm. not just the problems. Uh, and that, I mean, it's easy to say, but that kind of gave a picture in people's mind uh, that you don't uh, necessarily look at the cycles of problems in a depressed way, but you actually think that you can build solutions using the same strength and the same interconnectedness. Uh, and that's what we find in aid that, uh, that success in one field would feed success in another field, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and things would connect up. Hmm. Uh, and and that gives a nonlinear growth to the organization. So I mean, you know, most as you said, um, most of us are interested in Indian issues and you know want to contribute in some way. And and for most of us, as is usually, you know, either give money or give some some time. But you left everything, your 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 bright future here in in America, as they say, and then you know you went back to India. So so tell me how that happened. Uh, and why you made that decision? Yeah, I mean, I did not leave everything like we are. Each of us is with us, and the people we love. Uh, and it's and I was also going back to India, right? It's a country that we actually left. Uh, you know, when when I'm going to India, I'm actually returning. So, uh, so I don't uh, think that you know that we should view the world is connected today, and it's not whether you are here or there. I think you can work for humanity. And, uh, and though aid has the name I and India in it, uh, the idea is that, uh, you know, is that we are doing something to build uh, for sustainable and equitable development. Uh, it's not only in India that, you know, we have the crisis, we have it all over the world, mm -hmm. uh, that we have one section of the world uh, which is really living off a vast majority of the world 
consuming the human resources and so on and also violating a lot of rights of the underprivileged. Uh, so, uh, so I kind of think that uh, uh, for me it was a little bit more difficult to leave the... Uh, I'm also very passionate about science and physics uh, because I kind of came here and like from childhood I wanted to, you know, like uh, science uh, appealed to me. So it was a harder decision for me to kind of think that I would be focusing more time on these kind of issues rather than maybe being a professional scientist. Uh, but uh, but then I thought that uh, there are anyway so many people who are doing the kind of physics that I do and uh, but but because partly because it was succeeding and it had grown quite a bit uh, and a lot of my time was being spent in it I thought that I could make a bigger difference uh, you know by working on this so it was a slow process it wasn't that you know from the beginning or there was a time that you said okay you know I'm yeah, when, when I made the decision to go back, it was yeah. and like within a few months, uh, you know, I went back. Mm -hmm. But my involvement uh, into causes uh, happened parallelly with my involvement uh, with my working uh, pursuing physics. So I was on the one hand very passionately, uh, you know, working on various physics things that we kind of uh, theoretical physics things. But on the other hand, I believe that life should not is not compartmentalized. Mm -hmm. So which is what I was telling my friends that. Uh, you know, while doing whatever professions we are doing here in the U.S., we should also parallelly spend some time on these kind of mom on, on equally meaningful things and not view that as something that we would do maybe after we go to some other position in life. Because a lot of times students will think that, you know, after they get a job uh, and they get settled in life, they'll do something back to the country. Mm. And if you talk to the people who are settled here, uh, they will say, we don't have time, as students, you all have time. Uh, my way of looking at things was that no matter which frame of reference you are in, they are the same. Mm. Like as a student or as a, uh, you know, as a professional here, uh, or as or in any other, day, you know, when you're in life, you can always find time to do things uh, for causes that are maybe more environmental friendly, causes that are more, uh, you know, trying to, look at uh, a self which is just beyond yourself and your family, mm -hmm. a larger self, uh, you know, and uh, and do something for the uh, that section of the world which really has built the rest of the world so we all could enjoy. Mm -hmm. So Aid India is, is a U.S., it was formed in the U.S. as a U.S. based organization, but you have, after you, I mean, six more people have left yeah, uh, their life or their career in, in the U.S. and went back. Right. And then on top of that, you have 20 people in India right. working full-time that's supported by, by right. aid. Now, it says Association for India's Development. I mean, do you think 27 people or I don't know how a million dollars that you raise every year is going to do the development for India? Or, or I mean, w what is the thinking here? Yeah, so I think, uh, I think the thinking here is that it's not money or people. Uh, that makes uh, you know that makes a change, uh, but uh, but uh, but I think it is it is that and also I think the thinking is that no change is too small. So so the idea is when you are doing these kind of things is not that uh, you is not necessarily that you change the world or you will change India. A lot of times you change yourself first mm. by you know by by doing this right you change yourself and you change your surroundings. And likewise, you also make some small contributions to changing, uh, say, the lives of the people in the villages or the lives of the people in India. Uh, and and th and I think every amount of that change matters. Uh, that's uh, that's what I I seriously believe. And uh, and like I said, things are non-linear. Now I can give you several examples where small models be even tried in one villages by various people, not just by by aid people involved with aid but by various NGOs and movements in India have been scaled up like say the Anna Hazare's watershed work mm -hmm. in Ralegaon City is a model uh, or Tarun Bharat Sang Rajan Singh Jais. It's a model for all of India and their successes in Maharashtra and Rajasthan uh, have uh, led, uh, have inspired even a lot of aid projects in Surudi for example. Uh, it has inspired one, some of the village people and aid supported them directly to construct watershed structures in their village 
to halt the flow of water so that it, it uh, so that uh, that water will be absorbed in their village and they drought prone village got transformed just like Anahazari's village and today their onion crop for example is 40 lakhs and that village the entire all the bonded labor uh, you know Ashok Reitner working with Madhuka Deshpande and with aid is the uh, person who led this transformation uh, and the, they are reporting that uh, there used to be bonded labor just like five years back in that village and now it's completely disappeared because it's become so much more prosperous because water, uh, because of saving water. And we learned from Anna Hazare's Ji's work by visiting there and being inspired by it. So, so I think small models uh, uh, which are successful do get replicated and oftentimes uh, solutions also are very local. So you don't need to necessarily think that everything should be replicated but locally in an area if something makes sense and if a small set of people with some sort of support can do something, then they should just go ahead and do it for, uh, because, you know, <laughs> small is beautiful. So, uh, so, so I think, uh, you know, we have both the visions that, uh, that no change is too small as well as the fact that some of the things, uh, small things just grow. I mean, it, they, they have a cascading effect mm. and they do lead to big changes. Now, how do you see... Um government's role in this in this process of development and uh, on what you're doing and what you're trying to achieve for India. So government, uh, of course, I, one way of looking at the government is that it is the biggest NGO because, uh, you know, the government has to safeguard the rights of the people. It has to ensure that, uh, you know, every Indian uh, has access to basic, uh, you know, food, water, shelter, livelihoods and a dignity of life. Uh, you know, so there is a definitely a role, uh, you know, for the government and uh, uh, and of course no NGO can replicate, uh, I mean, uh, we, the idea of an aid or a movement or the NGO work is not to just simply replicate whatever government is supposed to do to run a parallel government. Mm -hmm. But the idea is to influence the democratic processes uh, so that there is greater accountability and transparency and more meaningful, people-friendly uh, agenda that is uh, known to work uh, can naturally be picked up and get strengthened. So, so like for example, these models uh, that succeed uh, in, in, in places, like in various fields, they are what I just call known to work. Uh, now, would they be picked up or, uh, uh, you know, uh, because they are helpful, or would you actually, for vested interests, uh, you know, contract out from government money to build some large something that actually is not beneficial to the people uh, and might in fact end up displacing a whole bunch of them, uh, you know, just because, uh, you know, that path of that model of development uh, is something that helps a few people, you know, and, and they are in power to, to do it, right? So these are the kind of questions that groups, uh, NGOs and movements in India are asking and uh, we are partnering, uh, you know, with several of these groups and, uh, and we find that there are also people in the government who ask these questions. Uh, Jairam Ramesh, for example, has been, uh, uh, when the BT Brinjal issue came up in mm -hmm. India, uh, he conducted public hearings in many, many places and uh, he took a very rational stand that, uh, that enough uh, long-term tests for measuring the long-term impacts of completely modifying the genes, mm. uh, you know, of brinjal to make it toxic to pests uh, could have repercussions both on the environment. You're talking about genetically modified... Uh, the GM crops, plant. yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so here uh, we have an... I think for the first time India has an environmental minister who is sensitive uh, to environmental issues in the country and, uh, and it's a great... Uh, it's great to see uh, you know, government uh, people taking those kind of stands. Mm. Uh, and uh, likewise, for example, in the Water Resource Minister Soz, uh, he has Saifuddin Soz a few years back, went to the Nanmada Valley uh, and, uh, uh, and said that uh, the rehabilitation had not been done. Uh, and therefore, uh, you know, until that, that's done, they cannot allow the height of that particular dam to go up. So, so you do get every now and then glimmers of hope from people in power and we every now and then meet uh, collectors, government bureaucrats, 
uh, who are uh, really interested in working honestly, passionately, and we feel that the their work strengthens the uh, work of groups like ours, and our work hopefully also strengthens the government. So I mean, a lot of people, you know, are sitting in America, uh, you know, coming from a kind of different background, and we think problem of India is is education, but you don't believe that is the problem or I mean that's one aspect of the problem so so tell us about you know how do you uh... yeah so I prefer to use the word learning to education uh, because education somehow seems to be something <laughs> there out there that you impart uh, and and in that sense we all are always learning and there's a lot of learning uh, you know that children do even out of school and so on uh, so but uh, but I think that uh, you know that the middle class Indians or the educated Indians believe that uh, education, educating the masses of India is what uh, will help uh, the masses get out of poverty. Right. And they do that because that seems to have worked for them. Mm -hmm. But I think what they don't recognize is that that has not worked for the people who are, uh, who are in the masses. Like they have actually gone to schools and the schooling system has failed them. Uh, the second thing is that, it, is that uh, what I feel is that a lot of, uh, there is, the educated mind is not a sensitive mind and a and lot of problems today are created by educated people. Uh, and, uh, and if you actually look at, uh, you know, so, so what I think is like an uneducated person can at the most fire a gun, let's say, but an educated person can invent the atomic and nuclear bomb the weapons, right, mm -hmm. of mass destruction. You cannot do it without education. Mm -hmm. Like you had to be, you had to educate, uh, you had to have a huge educated class to be able to amass the kind of weapons and come so close to D-Day for the entire earth. Mm -hmm. uh, so, 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 uh, so I believe that, uh, you know, that education alone, uh, you know, does not, actually, it's not clear to me. It gives you a strength, but the sign of that could be plus or minus. And it's more important what the, whether your education is positive or negative, whether it is useful to the society or, or, or not. Mm. Right? I, so I, I believe I, that, uh, you know, so I believe that, uh, that education, while it's important uh, and definitely children should uh, be given every opportunity and a good opportunity uh, to learn uh, their, uh, you know, reading, writing, arithmetic and other abilities. Uh, and, and, and that's an important part of uh, childhood along with playing and learning uh, and nobody should be denied that for want of good uh, resources and so on. Mm -hmm. However, uh, that doesn't solve the problem that could, uh, you know, it, 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 that's not the crisis, that, that's, it's a symptom rather than a cause. Uh, the lack, lack of, of uh, uh, yeah, the overpopulation of India, of India, the illiteracy in India these are symptoms that something is wrong. Mm. The fact that people are sleeping hungry, uh, like in the world today, uh, you know, and it's the 21st century, and so many billion people all over the world go to sleep hungry, while there are more than an equal number of people who are who have so much food and uh, so much to spend mm. that they literally, you know, throwing that money away, uh, you know, and uh, see, so th those are symptoms. Uh, you know, and education is, and lack of education is, or what we think, illiteracy and so on, it's a symptom. Uh, the, the problems though are, uh, the causes though are the fact that we have violated the rights of people, we have exploited them, we have oppressed them. And, and uh, poverty is not a state uh, that automatically happens. People are forced into poverty by pressure, which is called, which is oppression. And you have to fight oppression and you have to ensure that everybody, uh, that, the, that, that we develop a moral fabric in today's world, uh, a fabric which is based on human rights and not necessarily a fabric which is based only on spiritualism and religion, which are also important. But it's equally important to realize that a fabric of human society that knows, believes and understands human rights and respects each other's rights of all people and gives a certain value to that, uh, you know, that's what, you know, we educated class have to really build. 
and along with the you know with the other uh, with the people who are not educated uh, who probably can appreciate the importance of that fabric more than us and if we build that fabric then i think all the symptoms will disappear including illiteracy overpopulation or overconsumption of resources you see which is that the side of uh, you know the population the greenhouse the global warming uh, the the greed that is driving uh, society so how 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 is aid t- trying to tackle that problem or you know, of educating people about the rights and these issues and how how are you doing it in america I, or, or i think we are uh, i mean see the thing is that like lot of times ngos and work of aid and uh, several groups we are in a fire fighting mode uh, in the sense that there is uh, we are often times uh, human rights and so on have already been violated right, yeah okay. and and we are like let's say the bopal is in mm-hmm. use nowadays and 25 years ago uh, <coughs> uh, the tragedy happened mm-hmm. people still are not compensated uh the fully and uh, the place hasn't been cleaned up and moreover the uh corporation dow which has bought uh, union carbide mm. uh is not uh, is denying any having any liability and it's not even accountable mm. uh, to the problem right so uh so so when you uh, you know so when we face so often times uh, we are responding mm. uh, you know to let's say uh uh the police uh, involvement in gujarat uh, at the time of the of the gujarat riots so mm-hmm. the the how the state used uh, itself to mm-hmm. uh, you know uh, to uh, to cause the riots in a, in a, in a manner of speaking and uh, similarly like the displacement of the narmada uh, by dams of adivasis uh, where uh, they were not consulted they were not uh you know they were not involved mm. in the decision making and then their rehabilitation is not there so we we get situations like this where a lot of activists already fighting and and a lot of us learn about what they are doing and then in solidarity we get involved and and then likewise we are working on some issues in villages we work in and uh, and there are uh, there is solidarity of other groups uh and and we give press releases so i think Uh, it's not a theoretical understanding but more practically uh it the it's built but maybe time has come to uh you know to also try to uh, put a to get a more deeper understanding mm. of what we all want to do together and how we want to weave this fabric uh, of uh, society in india and in the world uh, where uh, the importance of institutions like these are a lot of these i believe are western ideas uh, that are there in our country which is not necessarily bad mm. uh, but uh, our country may not have yet had something like the french revolution mm. which understands how to uh, make these systems that we have built like the police the um, uh, the courts and so on how to make them accountable to the people oh, yeah. and how to have an understanding in the middle class community that when somebody is protesting they are not stopping development mm. but they are actually uh, you know they are actually putting in place a system of sustainable democratic means of development well, they, they want to be part of the development right. actually the development is leaving them behind right so the protest is about yes you know enjoying that so let's go back to you know back to you i mean you have a science background and and lot of things that you know you see at the local level happening in small towns and villages can have a scientific solution to their everyday problem and you have some examples of of that right so uh, g- tell us about it yeah so uh, so one of the things that uh, we are currently uh, you know excited by is this hay basket which is actually a traditional idea it's a very simple device that saves the time of uh, you know lot of uh, time of cooking mm-hmm. uh so the idea is that uh, you know we we basically take a bamboo basket which provides livelihood to the bamboo artisan mm-hmm. and we take straw and make it uh, make the straw into a rope and we use the hay or straw to line this bamboo basket and stitch the lining with it this hay padding is hay is a good insulator of heat so it ensures that the heat doesn't escape so it's like a hot box that mm-hmm. is locally made uh it helps in cooking rice because it 
uh, when you half cook the rice on the stove and you transfer it and close it, then it, it retains the heat mm -hmm. and the rest of the rice cooks in its own heat without needing the energy. Uh, and it actually cuts down the cooking time of village women from 40 minutes to 15 minutes because women are often times the people who are cooking the rice mm -hmm. and also of, of collecting this firewood. And uh, we've, the connections here in this hay cooker are very, very curious, you'll be interested in that. And uh, that's partly kind of shows the interconnectedness that we in aid have always, always been talking about. For example, uh, the village people have to use actually two times the water when they cook rice than we do. So for one cup of rice, we normally put two cups water right. while they put four cups water. The reason we found is because they use firewood. So how do you turn the flame down uh, to sim when the rice starts boiling? It's very hard to do that with firewood. And, and therefore the rice will uh, get burnt, mm. you know, because you can't turn the flame down. So the traditional solution to that is add extra water so it doesn't get burnt. Mm. But that water remains. So they, so typically in the Indian style of cooking rice, you drain that water. Mm. If you now look at the energy involved, Double the water takes almost double the time uh, and double the firewood. Mm. So you cut that, uh, you know. So now with our hay boxes, using firewood, you can cook rice the way we do, with one cup rice to two cups water. So they are literally halving the amount of water they are putting in their rice, which is, uh, uh, which is reducing the fuel yeah. by half, by more than half, because now it only they need to bring it to boil. And it doesn't burn because the moment it boils, you're transferring it to the hay box. And then while the rice is cooking in the hay box, they can parallelly using the same one little thing, uh, they can cook, make the next stick. So they get parallel processing. Unlike kitchens here, which have four stoves, a village kitchen typically has one stove, which means the village woman has a series cooking. She's not parallel processing, so one dish after the other. Now our hay box actually gives her a parallel stove because it's actually cooking there then it's locally made and it's locally sold. So it's made in a village and sold in a village. Uh, you know, and we are very proud of that because, uh, yeah, so the bamboo artisan and the various village workers, they get, uh, you know, they get a livelihood. Mm. And it costs about 80 rupees to 100 rupees, uh, which is affordable by village family because typical earnings of a village family would be 40 to 80 rupees a day uh, because of the daily wage they uh, labor. And uh, when they see something meaningful that costs 80 rupees and that saves so much time and if it actually works and if we are delivering a good product uh, then they will, uh, they are rational people and they would buy it. So, uh, and so we are actually selling this, we are not giving it free and it's creating employment for the bamboo artisan, it's saving the women's time and it moreover reduces greenhouse gases because each time you cook rice you about half kilogram of carbon dioxide is emitted and we do not realize it uh, until I did the calculation I did not know but now each time I cook rice for the family or we cook rice at home I see like almost half a kg of CO2 coming out of it uh, so so now you reduce that by half uh, because so make it quarter each time because the amount of cooking time has reduced so so your science background helped uh, solve uh, this this major problem of uh, it of helped understand women. yeah it uh, helped understand uh, the various links involved mm. the solution itself uh, is a it's a traditional idea I think from Africa uh, they used to use uh, hay baskets in Africa so I came across it on the internet but the design that we have made in the village is of course our design based on you Local. know what's locally available yeah. and so on mm. uh, but uh, it's important. Uh, to actually come up uh, with good designs that are also marketable. Uh, now, uh, now I went and looked at the government's Ministry of uh, Renewable Resources website and one of the states had a hay box cooker and I am pretty sure that that's the only model they made, took a photograph and put it on the web because it's literally made out of plywood, uh, right? And it's a kind of a square rectangular box made out of plywood and it's titled hay box. Now, how much would it cost, yeah. right? Like, have they thought of making it out it of cannot bamboo? Be, cannot be made locally. Yeah. Cannot be yeah, made yeah, locally, yeah, yeah. yes. So, so you don't want a nicely polished hay box. Yeah. You want something that every village woman can use right. and can buy. 
and can be proud of, right? Mm -hmm. And after we sold our first hundred hay boxes, one year after that, I went to all the houses in our villages, uh, you know, to at in the evening time to see if the women are actually using it, uh, and men or women are actually using it, and we knocked and. 95 to 98 of them out of 100 uh, you know just showed up when we we just knocked on the door and said please show us the rice that you made today and they all came with oh, the rice okay. in the hay box and then I and I did not know that after one year they are still using it yeah, so wow. this is our first year so the bamboo basket and the hay uh, last at least two years because now our first cookers are about two years old and they are still going strong and you have several examples of, of like this, you know, yes. finding local solutions that, that works. Uh, Absolutely. So, uh, you know, um, now this question everybody uh, probably asks you, uh, the movie So This that was that was made, you know, that showed a NASA scientist going back and maybe using his science background. And uh, you were one of the inspiration uh, for this movie, right? Is that... Is that, is that yeah, correct? so actually Ashutosh Gowarikar met yeah, Arvinda and me and uh, discussed the script and so on and also visited the village Bilgaon yeah. uh, where uh, through aid support and through a collaboration with several other groups we made a micro hydro product, pro project like we basically had a turbine and uh, you know below a waterfall mm -hmm. which lighted the entire village of Bilgaon about 200 families or so. Anil and Madhu were the key uh, people who actually built that project. They are from a group called People's School of Energy. And Sham Bhai from Dulia, from the Narmada support group in Dulia. So he made the pen stock and the turbine itself was uh, made by a professor from IIC Bangalore. Uh, so there were several people involved you know, in the collaborations. We were the NRA <laughs> angle. In that collaboration, okay. which Ashutosh was, uh, you know, interested. more interested in. Yeah. Of course, it was a project supported by aid. So Mal Anil, Anil Madhu and we collaborated because uh, we were building these pedal power generators to light up uh, the schools in the Narmada Valley. Mm. So that's something that uh, Michael, myself, and another volunteer of aid, Vankesh, we had designed. And Anil and Madhu were also working on electricity, uh, you know, uh, work in micro hydro and in in village called Domkedi, which is now submerged. And we all decided to pool our resources together uh, to and we took up Bilgaum because, uh, in my mind, we wanted to show that uh, we could light up an entire village in the Narmada Valley, which is completely dark, while the Sardar Sarovar Dam <laughs> does not give electricity to even one village of the Narmada Valley. <laughs> while it displaces 245 of those villages. So that just shows how the development gone wrong. Mm. The dam is right there. It is actually the city which is remote. Normally in the city you think that the tribal areas are remote right. and do not have electricity. But here the dam is in the tribal area. Mm. So what is remote to the dam is the city. Mm. But the, all the electric power from the dam and the Sadasarova dam is already producing electricity. Mm. It is going to Surat, it's going to Dulia, it's going to Bombay and it's going to Madhya Pradesh, it's going to various cities in all of these places. Not a single wire from the Sadar Sarovar Dam goes to these 245 villages which have been displaced, where since only the lower parts of the villages are displaced, the upper parts are still there. They are not displaced and a lot of time, a lot of people have not got rehabilitation. So they have just moved up as well and there are anyway upper hamlets mm. for every village. Like Jalsindi has lower hamlets that are submerged, upper hamlets that are not. How come Jalsindi has sacrificed its village? Yeah. Half Part of the yeah. Jalsindi citizens are displaced mm. and yet Jalsindi hasn't got, uh, you know, electricity from the Sadasarova dam and it is so close. As to the big. dam compared to Dhulia right. and Surat, which is getting the electricity from this dam. Right? It's simply b because the tribal people who are living in darkness are not on the agenda mm. of the government. So, if the dam was built for first for them and then for the rest of the country, then the priorities would be right. Mm. We might still have a dam, but the dam would be much smaller because people would have realized, as we did when we actually looked at the cost and benefit of this dam, that a much smaller dam would deliver better. Mm. Uh, it would not compromise on some of the benefits. In fact, the benefits, would, the cost benefit would be better because it wouldn't submerge the fertile fields of Nimar, mm. uh, which, uh, which are these plains of, uh, you know, Madhya Pradesh 
and the dam is so big that the water has entered the village, the plain. It wouldn't submerge those, it wouldn't submerge the natural resources. For so many years, so many farms have been submerged with, and, and the entire big canal system that was supposed to be built, which cost the most amount of money, is, is dragging. I mean, it's way behind schedule. Mm. And there's nobody who has protested on the canals. Mm. And, uh, and yet the system is not done. And so, now I think even a lot of people in Gujarat have also realized that uh, that they, they are not getting the kind of benefits that they were expected from mm -hmm. this dam, mm -hmm. which is what Namla Bachao Andolan was, and we learned a lot from Meda and Meda Ji and her movement mm -hmm. uh, when we visited. And about and one of the things as a scientist I kind of realized is that the environmental movements in India, whether it's Meda Patkar's work or Aruna Roy's work or Arvind Kejriwal or Leo Saldana, or Michael Masgamkar. Uh, or Dayamani Barla, there are like so many people doing such wonderful work in India and this work is scientific and we should be proud of mm -hmm. it. So it, if you and government knows that it is like lot of people in the government know that what these movements of India are telling is correct. They admit it uh, and oftentimes they also in science you oftentimes like when you're quoting another person's work uh, you refer and oftentimes these movements are uh, the work of these movements the reports of these movements are references even for government uh, and in government documents wow. right because they know that uh, you know that these are right and yet uh, these are the this is the real India that is unacknowledged mm -hmm. and a lot of times educated people might brush away an environmental movement as being and especially because a lot of times these movements are being run by very powerful women. Mm -hmm. Powerful in the sense of coming and making those kind of sacrifices that many men haven't made. Mm -hmm. You know, for uh, like there is a Bhopal ki Nari, right. uh, you know, the Mahilas of the Narmada Valley and in cases. Uh, that, that lot of men or the male feeling of engineering and science may be kind of things that the environmental side is more feminine or it's, therefore it's romanticizing while actually real development is more masculine maybe uh, you know and has to be more aggressive but this is entirely uh, actually this is entirely the wrong mm -hmm. way because uh, the environmental movements in India are you know you should not look at it in this gender fashion gender insensitive way there, there is no I mean there is no romanticizing just because women are involved in these movements. And a lot of times these movements are much more scientific and we should as Indians be proud of what they are delivering. I know Michael and Swati's work on pollution is, uh, you know, of the, of the industries in the Gujarat Mumbai industrial corridor is useful for the Pollution Control Board and is referred to by the Pollution Control Board. They have taken photographs and and got government to recognize how drinking water in so many villages, the color of it has changed. And, and the government would have then, uh, you know, uh, started sending uh, alternate tank water and is now pondering what it has to do with that. Mm. By Sunita Narayan of, uh, you know, another name that who brought up the issue of pesticides in coke. Right. Like yeah. there's so many wonderful Whatever. people in India who and, are and, actually and, doing and, and, and use of science to benefit people's lives. So you could have been doing theoretical physics here, but actually uh, you're doing uh, or, or, other, or even other people sure. utilizing yeah. science that would impact uh, you know yeah. uh, daily life of. of the yeah. I think that's the yeah. power of theoretical physics or of science mm -hmm. that uh, that it helps you understand. A, a complex uh, situation in simple terms uh, and gives you a kind of a greater feel for uh, you know for the for the important things mm -hmm. uh, you know in, in a complicated situation so to that uh, extent uh, I think science and scientific way of thinking has been useful to me mm -hmm. and I also think that uh, uh, like for example like I found many people from IIT mm -hmm are also in these movements. Like it's not that every person who has graduated from IIT has gone abroad or gone to corporate sector in India. Mm. They're also, you know, uh, working on the, and uh, you know, on these issues mm. with NGOs. And I'm using IIT simply because it has such a name. Right. Uh, but there are so many smaller engineering and science institutions and of other fields also 
that have produced youngsters mm. uh, who are working with NGOs and I mean it's your own sons and daughters might be passionate mm. uh, you know uh, or about about these causes in the world and this definitely are so important causes that they cannot be dismissed of as uh, as being uh, uh, you know secondary to me so so t just so you know to wrap it up i mean you have given some examples of aid work but just to give a brief idea so that we can understand the, the diversity of work you're doing so just give give some examples of you know what kind of you know ex uh, work you are involved in and you know different parts of india so just, just yeah. So, so we are involved in, uh, so one of the things that uh, you know we are currently interested in uh, is on agricultural issues. So Kiran uh, who has, is one of the latest persons who has gone back uh, you know from here uh, back to India to work full time on agricultural issues. So we are uh, uh, you know concerned about the farming crisis in agriculture and uh, we, uh, we are taking that as a new agenda in air. Of course it's all ongoing in India but we are supporting excellent people like Revati who is working in organic farming mm. and who has uh, in during tsunami time she has helped reclaim the land in Tamil Nadu and then she uh, Bill Clinton saw her work uh, and this work of hers was supported by it and he uh, requested her to go to Indonesia and Sri Lanka wow. and she made an impact there uh, when cyclone Isla hit That's West right. Bengal Somnath from it Boston requested her to go to there and she went there uh, and uh, Kiran has been working on Brinjal campaign so on Balaji was one of the first people along with Arvind and me Balaji Arvind and me we actually all returned together in fact Balaji returned a few months before us and uh, he is working on in education issues in Tamil Nadu mm -hmm. uh, with uh, Ravi Shankar and uh, they are uh, basically their agenda is uh, to try to ensure that all children of Tamil Nadu uh, you know can have uh, access to basic education uh, you know at the primary level uh, uh, you know and no child should be denied that. Uh, Rachna is working in Bhopal uh, on the Bhopal issue and uh, about five uh, in 2005 we took anti-corruption as a big agenda in it just like now we are uh, taking on agriculture and uh, here we are supporting because of two acts in India right to information act and the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. There is a new feeling in all of us that these acts should not go the same way as some of the older things. Mm. Uh, there is a feeling that this is a new generation of India both in the government and in the NGO sector and in the people in general and therefore the implementation of these acts uh, should be made in a transparent and accountable way. So AID has supported several uh, groups uh, working and people, individuals working on ensuring that RTI and NREGR are implemented effectively in India and ensuring that they, these acts do not get diluted uh, you know by vested interests. So that has been uh, and we are continuing to do that and we entered that again as a strategy in 2005 uh, and, uh, and devoted time and effort to it and now that's continuing very nicely. So, so we do pick up new areas and uh, as new things happen in India mm. Right, we pick up new areas and we also continue work in things like education and all uh, as well, you know, which are, which are important and technology of course, an area that I am working on, uh, you know, like say the electrification of villages or this hay box cooker, mm -hmm. we are thinking of working on water issues, water purification uh, and, uh, and just the, we are working for example in village drainage systems to make it simpler like let the, you know, just build soap pits and we see that that marvelously transforms the village because just couple of soap pits we built in a village for the cost of like 3000 rupees. Soap pits are, are, are kind of a way to drain the excess water or... or right, yeah. so near a well or, or at a boring where yeah. village women are washing dishes and so on, yeah. where water, there's more water. So it's not going in, in lake or ponds or rivers but instead you you just sink it into, into the, the ground yeah. right there yeah. instead yeah. of and carrying that water all all across uh, the spreading village. the disease along the way. Right. and just doing just digging a pit and covering it with stones yeah. and creating a model within a week that whole situation changes like that all the water stagnant water dries up mm. and people start reporting that the mosquitoes have gone down mm. and uh, you know you can imagine the benefit of that so there is a lot of simple things that can still be done 
and uh, we are uh, we are uh, looking very passionately at simple technology that can change the life of the village woman who carries from when she is 3 years to when she is 80 years had loads of firewood mm. uh, and works still on a chula that gives so much smoke right. you know without any advanced technology for cooking such as even the hay basket mm. which can be simply made right there right mm. so that's that's what we are doing in the uh, we recently we got a donation from Philips of about 200 and how much is it 250,000 LED uh, bulbs okay so so we are uh, so with Michael uh, we are trying to make solar LED lamps uh, and this donation enables us to give these lamps uh, without charging for the bulbs which is the most expensive part of an LED lamp which are very energy efficient devices right so village people with very little uh, energy uh, can light up their homes much better than then so they have alternate access mm. so so we are also doing using modern technology so uh, last message how i mean people sitting at their homes and watching this uh, how can they get involved what can what can they do to help your work i think uh, people at home can definitely visit our web website it's aidindia.org a i d i n d i a.org they can get in touch with us aidsite at gmail.com a i d s i t e at gmail.com they can donate contribute money because uh, that's the easiest thing for people to do and uh, any amounts uh, you know go a long way so we are tax exempt both the aid is tax exempt in the us so your donations are tax deductible aid india is similarly tax deductible it has ATG and so on in India. Uh, so uh, please, uh, you know, make a donation and and definitely volunteer. We have meetings in several major cities in the U.S. every week. Uh, so you can come to one of our weekend meetings. We call them community service hours. So uh, out there we discuss projects in India. We plan fundraisers. Uh, we uh, we try to screen documentaries on issues in India. Meet social workers from India and you kind of get connected to other people who are serious and passionate about doing something uh, right and so you kind of uh, you are not alone mm. uh, that way you know thinking about wanting to do something you you will find a like-minded group of people uh, so you can join our chapter volunteer hours or community service hours uh, and likewise in india when you're visiting india or if you are in india you can volunteer uh, at the, in the cities with our chapters or in the projects in our villages like most of the aid work is going on in villages in India a uh, few even in the cities in the slums so they can spend days or months uh, they, you can weeks, spend days yeah. months or weeks so generally to be effective you should at least spend a few months uh, yeah. you know uh, with the work but if you come uh, but yeah. for touring and for some awareness of uh, you know what's happening and uh, then obviously any tip of any length mm -hmm. is fine mm -hmm. But if you are serious about wanting to do something, at least two to three months uh, would be, uh, if you can put that kind of time, uh, you can probably meaningfully uh, help out in some program that we are doing. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you for talking Thank you. to Sagazan. All, all the best for you. Thank, Thank you. you.